Good evening. Good evening and welcome to a very special evening in conversation with James Gray. Yes. yes. Woo. My name is Cameron Bailey. I'm the Artistic Director and Co-Head here at TIFF, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here. Uh, it's a very special evening for us, special weekend really, to have James in town and to be showing uh, his films and to give uh, all of us an opportunity to hear some of what he has to say about what went into making them. I want to begin by acknowledging where we are tonight, the land that we're on. This is the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and Huron-Wendat First Nations. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work uh, in this community. Um, yeah, please, go ahead. I want to uh, thank all of the people and organizations who make what we do at TIFF possible, tonight's event and everything we do all year round, beginning with our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and all of our public support we get from the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. Big thanks also to the individuals, members, donors, subscribers, people like you, uh, who support what we do, our charitable mission to transform the way people see the world through film. Now this event tonight uh, complements our first ever TIFF Cinematheque retrospective dedicated to the films of James Gray, and it runs all the way through uh, January 18th. Um, James Gray uh, is a singular voice uh, in American cinema, in cinema generally, and as he prepares his uh, upcoming film, Ad Astra, which we will see uh, sometime later this year. We're really thrilled to be able to look back on his work and, um, and gain some insight from the director himself. Uh, he was just 23 years old when he made his feature film debut, Little Odessa, which won the Silver Lion at the Venice Film Festival. And of the five films a Queensborn filmmaker has made since 1994, four have screened in competition at Cannes. Rarer still, uh, Gray's filmography boasts a unity and a confidence that's lacking from most filmographies, uh, double or triple its size. It's, I think, quite simply some of the best uh, American cinema of the past few decades. His films include The Yards, We Own the Night, Two Lovers, The Immigrant, and The Lost City of Z. I think here we're allowed to call it The Lost City of Z. Uh, he's been hailed as a critical darling of France and received the admiration of uh, New Wave director Claude Chabrol. He's also worked with legendary actors of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, Vanessa Redgrave, Robert Duvall, Faye Dunaway, James Caan, Alan Burstyn, so many others, and also uh, directed um, actors such as Mark Wahlberg, Eva Mendez, and his constant collaborator, Joaquin Phoenix, to breakout performances. Most importantly, I think James Gray is a filmmaker who looks to be out of step with his time. He began in the 90s, but there is no irony in his films. Uh, he's made uh, films that sidestep franchise blockbusters and mumblecore and art house slow cinema and a, a lot of the filmmaking trends that he's been um, uh, contemporary with, but he hasn't uh, succumbed to fashion ever. Uh, you don't escape the clutches of the era you live in by accident. I think Gray's films are powerful acts of will and that's what makes them so fascinating to watch and to watch again. I'm looking forward to hearing, this, uh, hearing what this man has um, turned uh, cinema into, the cinema of the, uh, this millennium, and turning it somehow away from the fashion of these times into uh, his own personal vision. I'm very glad that he's here for a conversation. Please join me in welcoming James Gray. Now this way. Welcome. Thank you. Thank Such you. a nice thing to say. Please, have a seat. James, thank you so much for joining us here in it's Toronto. My pleasure. Are you well, kidding? Well, Got out of the house. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a good thing. Um, I think most people here would be familiar with uh, some or maybe even all of your films. Um, and we're lucky to be able to, to be showing them over the next uh, few days, one we haven't seen already. Um, through all of them, or through many of them anyhow, there is a, a, an interest in immigrant uh, families and the immigrant experience and how that sense of being outside of 
society and its, its, um, its history uh, informs its, uh, your characters. And I wonder for you, coming from an immigrant family, your grandparents migrated to uh, the New York area. What did watching American movies as a child of an immigrant family mean for you? What a great question. <laughs> um, what an Amer watching American, well, I, 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 I had a, it's interesting, my, if I, me, 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 it's gonna be a lot of me tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's why we're here, James. I, I suppose. <laughs> That's your first mistake. Um, <laughs> I was born in 1969, which means that I sort of saw the end of the new Hollywood, and that's kind of when I started going to movies mm -hmm. avidly. And I, I'm a very strange crossover period. You know, I witnessed the Jaws, which I still love, by the way, but Jaws was a, a kind of a very different kind of movie than had been being made from 1967 to mm -hmm. about 1975. And uh, I really loved that movie, but, and I still do. But the movie that changed everything for me was Apocalypse Now, and then a year later, Raging Bull. And Raging Bull. Just, did you see those when they came out? Because Apocalypse did, Now is 1979. You're That's 10 right. years old. It was an act of absolute parental uh, insanity. <laughs> I'm sure my father should be picked up by social services or something. Um, but I, I don't forget it, mm. you know. It was a, there was a movie theater in New York that was called the Ziegfeld. It's now gone. It just, it, I think it, like just last year or maybe mm. two years ago, it was the biggest it's theater huge. in New York. Yeah. It was huge. And it was like a, an old movie palace. I don't know if you'd ever mm -hmm. been there. Yeah, so you know what yeah. I'm talking about. And I, I remember going there. It was a very hot day at the end of August. And I was given a folder that didn't have credits, the movie. Uh, and I thought, well, what the hell is this? You know, I'm, there's no credits on this. And um, I, 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 I'm, I, it's, it sounds overly romantic. I never forget it. You know, the black screen and yeah. And I thought, well, what is that? And I had never seen anything like it. And to be honest, I really liked the first two hours, <laughs> and I didn't like the Brando stuff. <laughs> Although now, if I see the film, although I haven't seen it in some time, but if I, if I watch it again, the last time I saw it, which was about 10 years ago, although I think I, I'm due for another watch because my son, who's 13 now, mm. is really after me to watch it, so I'm going to have to check it out again. But the last time I watched it, I thought the Brando stuff was the best stuff in the movie. <laughs> shows, you, great. shows you how uh, things change. But it, the, what it made me feel was that the cinema was, I, I mean, for lack of a better way of putting it, an art form. I knew something else was going on. Mm. And I'm not denigrating Jaws, which like I say, I think is a brilliant movie and it's unbelievably made. I mean, the guy, Spielberg's ability to stage scenes is absolutely peerless. But it, there's no other way to put it. Apocalypse Now is very different from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other pictures I saw, <laughs> other than Jaws, were I thought inferior. I had seen Superman, I had seen the remake of King Kong by John Gullerman, I had seen a bunch of other pictures like that, probably a lot of Disney, and then there was Martin Sheen talking to me <laughs> and punching mirrors. And so that was the first thing, but in relation to your question, the movie that actually changed things for me in that way was Raging Bull because mm. um, that I saw at a theater called The Sutton, which was on 57th Street, and I, I sneaked in because I was too young. and. Uh, no, I had never seen a movie where people talked like that, which was to say they talked like the people that lived down the street. Mm -hmm. You know, I had this friend of mine named Seth Tratner. I don't know what happened to Seth, but uh, I'm sure I'll get like some, I'm not on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, but if I were, I'd get 50 tweets. <laughs> by the tweets. time we leave. By the time we leave, Seth, right. Yeah. Seth Tratner's gonna reach out to me, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, and he, he, his, his dad would stick his head out the window in the alley Surf! when it was time for him to come home for dinner. <laughs> and I see Raging Bull, and in the first couple of minutes, the first six minutes of the movie, whatever it is, De Niro sticks his head out the window and goes, Hey, Larry! Larry, I'm going to have that daughter dead in the hallway, Larry! <laughs> you hear me? And it was like, my brother and I thought it was the funniest movie we'd ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Raging Bull is not a funny movie. Yeah. But we thought it was hilarious, because we couldn't believe 
I mean, I know that's not Russian immigrants. Mm -hmm. It's not even Italian immigrants. But the but you, you recognize can, you can it. recognize the ethnographic yeah. honesty of it. It's funny. Scorsese talks about watching on the waterfront yeah. as a boy and having that same moment of recognition. Yeah. Characters who looked and sounded like people he knew. Yeah, it's funny because uh, Marty is from Flushing, mm. which is where I'm from. Right. Uh, and. Uh, he moved to Little Italy with his mom and dad when I think he, I think he was 10 or 11. I, I can't remember exactly. But uh, I said to him, I said, well, how, how, you grew up in Flushing. How was that? He said, Flushing, Flushing was paradise. Flushing was paradise. <laughs> Flushing is paradise? <laughs> I grew up in a semi-attached row house. Flushing's not paradise. But for him, you could see, because mm. Elizabeth Street was pretty nasty when he was there. But in any event, yes, I... I know that that's a movie for him, but for me, it was his film. It was mm. Raging Bull because I, I, there was an, a frankness to it, mm -hmm. a specificity of character that uh, really spoke to me. To this day, it's a movie that I love to show to the assistant director mm. of any movie I'm doing because, and then I've been very lucky to work with the same person now, a brilliant guy named Doug Torres, who's the AD. And the assistant director does a lot of the work with extras because the director is not supposed to talk to the mm. extras except en masse, which is very irritating, but it's the truth. <laughs> and there's a thing where uh, De Niro is leaving Webster Hall, uh, which is where there's this, been this, he first sees Vicky LaMotta in this dance hall and uh, after he sees her at the pool. and. Uh, there's a shot that carries with De Niro as he walks downstairs, and in the foreground you see a guy cleaning up the vomit off somebody else's tie. Mm. And it's incredible, because it's like a, a detail that you catch on viewing four or five. Mm. But it's something that he was so, is, so uh, attuned to and gift, gifted and uh, such a great power of observation, and that felt so honest. And I had never seen that in a movie. And then, weirdly, because of the way that these things work, I saw The Godfather after I saw Raging Bull. Okay. Uh, and The Godfather has some of that too, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, and and that and The Godfather Two, which has that The Godfather Part Two, which has that whole Ellis Island sequence, yeah. um, really spoke to me. And and I started to recognize my neighborhood and my grandparents, mm. frankly, who came through Ellis Island. Huh. Interesting. So. In the 1970s, Scorsese, Coppola, and others were yeah. really showing something of that Italian immigrant experience, yeah. your family's Russian-Jewish Russian. immigrant. Yeah. Is there a difference, or when you're watching these movies on screen, does it just feel like these are New York immigrant characters? They feel like my people. It's also a great question. I think it's a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, I think that uh, I'm probably, my background's probably far less commercial. <laughs> uh, if you watch, what do you mean by that? Um, well, I mean, I'm being facetious, but if you watch Goodfellas, <laughs> You know, the, everyone's, I mean, he's a mobster, but everyone's having a good time. Mm -hmm. And they're like slicing the, yeah, I mean, he sli sliced the garlic and it was so thin. <laughs> Karen, they're all having a great time and they're going to the Copacabana. And, you know, I grew up, my grandparents were pure Russian. I mean, they didn't speak any English at all. Mm -hmm. And you went into their place and they had the crappy wallpaper and it was always very dark and smelled like mothballs. And <laughs> you heard the Victrola and it was always playing like, you know, like like <laughs> Volga Boatman, you know, and, and uh, I, you, you're laughing. I was being absolutely serious. I actually and saw she, the My Volga grandmother yeah. bought <laughs> potatoes in 50 pound sacks, and uh, you know, he had his Model A truck in the garage that was non functioning, but he kept it anyway. And I said, Grandpa, why do you still have a truck that doesn't drive? And my father translated him, and he said, Because you never know when they'll come for you. Uh, yeah. And they were really dark and very emotionally repressed. And he, my grandfather was extremely wistful uh, about Russia. I have absolutely no idea why to this mm. day, uh, mm. because he had to flee. Uh, he was forced into the army. His story is fascinating. He was forced into the army, but being Jewish, uh, he was told by the people in his group that he was gonna not live the night. And so he essentially went AWOL made his way through Turkey somehow, wound up in South America and came through Ellis Island as a South American immigrant because huh. in 1923 when he came, there were quotas. Right. So uh, that was the only way he could get in. Hmm. My grandmother was, her parents were quite literally murdered by Cossacks in front of her and apparently had nightmares every week till the day she died. And they would still talk about the old country with hmm. like 
great love and reverence. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? They're like, cut, cut off grandma's head. Your grandma, you know, great, your, grandma, your mother's head. And they, they, they were like, oh, this country was so beautiful you couldn't imagine. And it was the opposite of what I saw in what I thought were inferior movies about mm. the subject, where you saw the immigrants saying, I came to America, and it was the land of beauty, and mm -hmm. I had all I could eat, <laughs> and I talked to cousin Shivlech, and she gave me the strudel and also the rugla, and I'm like, I don't recognize that fucking mm -hmm. thing. What are you yeah. talking about? I recognize an unhappy guy who sat there crying in his seat on the sofa. You'd say, Grandpa, what's wrong? And I'd have to get translated, and then he would say, oh, and then I would say, well, what does that mean? My father would say, don't worry about it. Leave him alone. Let's go eat. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, in the films, is particularly the first film, which is Little Odessa, I had tried to put my grandparents mm -hmm. and my parents into mm -hmm. the movie as much as I could. The yes. mood of that apartment. You know, my mother was uh, dead of brain cancer a couple of years before, uh, four years before that movie was made, but I put it into the movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to try to impart this kind of mood in the house. And I got to know some people in that uh, environment uh, in Brighton Beach, and they're not what I saw in Goodfellas mm -hmm. or The Godfather or Raging Bull, actually, he, do, he, do, he doesn't sell you that story that mm -hmm. much. Raging no. Bull, Salvi is kind of a sleazy guy. It's, very, it's, a, it's a darker view of it. Yeah. Um, in any event, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm giving you too long an answer. No, no, this is good like because you're leading right into what I wanted to ask you about Go ahead. next, which is... Um, don't get out enough, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> we have time. Um, Little Odessa, your, your first feature uh, with Tim Roth, yep. really, to me, does bring together the kind of the observed reality that you would have seen growing up with the American crime genre, right? And somehow yep. you're able to knit those two things together. It, it's, it's a movie, and so it has some sort of you know, genre elements to it, but the details of it are very real. They feel like it is something that you would have lived through. And I wonder how you knitted together the genre elements with what you saw. I, I'm just that good. <laughs> no, I'm uh, I That's haven't seen fun. that movie. I, yeah. I'm, I'm kidding because uh, it comes from Great Insecurity. I haven't mm. seen that movie in many years, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, they showed it in France not too long ago as a uh, showing my films, and uh, I was supposed to do a Q and A afterwards. And I thought, well, I'll watch it again. It's been you know twenty years or whatever. Mm. And I, I I saw five minutes. I I, I couldn't bear it. Really? Uh, yeah. I, I I saw a lot of mistakes, and I mm. saw uh, a, a, and it, a reliance on what you just talked about, a mm. little bit of a reliance on the genre, right. which uh, bothered me. But I didn't try to manufacture it when I did it. Yeah. In fact, when the film was made, it was made very much in the same moment as uh, Reservoir Dogs. And it's the opposite of Reservoir yeah, Dogs. Yeah, it's interesting too because uh, I like Reservoir Dogs, but my ambition was to do the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I saw somebody get shot on St. Mark's Place uh, really? when I was, uh, I guess I was 13, so in 1982. And, um, it was the opposite of what I saw in a lot of movies. Mm -hmm. It wasn't funny or charming or exciting. Um, it was very upsetting, and it was very short and loud. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, this is not to denigrate Reservoir Dogs because it's, a, it's another thing. It becomes almost like a heightened reality. It becomes yeah. almost like... Um, like a, like a kind of uh, like a kind of performance art or something. No, they're very different movies. But yeah. the, the the opening scene of Little Odessa, where Tim Roth uh, executes that hit, yeah. it, all you see on his face is like a little twinge yeah. when he walks away. It's like a, something you know, it's cold outside or something. That's yeah. all you get. When you know, it's funny now because uh, I feel like I I keep seeing people that I grew up with now getting mm. indicted connected to the president, which is very disturbing. <laughs> is that right? Uh, you know, all, like <laughs> Russian connections and all this, and I'm like, oh. I, I knew that guy. It's very weird. <laughs> <laughs> this could take a oh, whole God. turn right now. I'm, I, this <laughs> we'll is keep going it on live and streaming. I'm going to wind up in prison or something. Um, but uh, what, I, what I noticed was that the people I met in that world were, were not funny or charming in any way, uh, and they weren't suave, and 
they had a kind of psychopathic blank affect. Mm. Um, and, you know, it was like, hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> you know, you were going to sit down or not? You know what I mean? It wasn't yeah, like, it wasn't yeah. like, hey, Tony, give me the thing with the thing. You know? <laughs> so I wanted to try and put that kind of guy yeah. into the movie because I hadn't seen that. Huh. And so Tim Roth's character is based on somebody I knew. And uh, he was a psychopath. Yeah, clearly. It's I mean, a movie, and, anyhow. And he was, but do you see the product of it? I also went to school with somebody else, a very sad story, who uh, murdered his mother. Um, and I kind of, Tim's character is a kind of combination of mm -hmm. one person I knew from Brighton and this guy I went to school with, who's dead now. But uh, it's a, but I, I tried to put the, I tried to bring a, a kind of a, an honesty to the violence mm -hmm. that I thought was not being done. Because mm -hmm. um, obviously The Godfather is maybe the greatest American film of all time and I, it's one of my favorite movies ever. But Sonny Corleone's killing, for example, is, I mean, bordering on preposterous, mm. as great as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great dramatically, but it's not operatic. realistic. It's very yeah. operatic, yeah. which is okay. Mm -hmm. And the fight scenes in Raging Bull are genius, mm -hmm. but they're very operatic. Sure. So um, I guess I was trying to find my own voice. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, you know, that's mm -hmm. why I say it's less commercial. It's not very exciting right. you know, to see somebody die like that. There is, there's always an emotional intensity, though, and you've talked about that as something that you're... you're, you're seeking in mm. in scenes and in the films that you make. Um, I want to go now to The Yards, uh, where you have um, the beginning of uh, this pairing of Mark Wahlberg and Joaquin Phoenix, right. um, who uh, came back and we own the night. But um, here, the scene we're going to show is from The Nightclub, uh, where they're drawn by Charlize Theron, a quite young Charlize Theron in this film as well. They're all young, really. Yeah, they were all like 12. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Joaquin Phoenix was 20 years old. Was he really? Oh, my God. I okay. think Wahlberg was maybe a little older. He was like 23 or something. All she, right. was, she was 21. Really? Yeah. So this, this scene to me really captures some of that character, the flavor of the neighborhood and this group of characters. And there's some cinematic things I want to talk about technically as well when we come back. But let's look at the scene from The Yards. Right. I hear you operate your handheld scenes often yourself. Is that true? Uh, sadly, it's no longer true. Okay. Uh, I used to. I can't anymore. My mm. eyesight is not good enough anymore. Oh, really? um, uh, this the film I just did is the first time I didn't. Okay. Um, I did it on Lost City of, of Zed. Very good, <laughs> by the way. I did it on Lost City of Zed and. Um, I'm going to say this and everyone's going to laugh, but it actually happened. I believe I herniated the disc in my neck doing it, oh, uh, which really? I later needed surgery for. Uh, and I realized on Lost City that um, my eyesight was failing me a little bit through mm. the viewfinder. And, and um, on the latest movie, I, I had uh, the cinematographer do it. Mm -hmm. And then that was a complete disaster because he's a superb operator. His name is Hoyte van Hoytema, oh, yeah, he's sure. a great cinematographer. Um, and then I would watch playback, and I'd say, no, 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 you don't do it like that. And then I would wind up doing it. <laughs> so half blind, I was operating <laughs> these shots. So they are, they're, the, my mm -hmm. operated shots are in the movies. I guess I, still, I am still doing it, but I'm not going to anymore because right. uh, it's, it's the unfortunate aspects of being 49 years old, sure. get, about to be 50, and my eyes are just terrible. Well, but yes, yeah. I do, I, because you know what it is? It's impossible to tell the person what exactly what you want, mm -hmm. um, and you have to kind of, the frame is very important. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what you decide upon. Uh, one of the major things you decide upon as a film director is what's in the frame and what's not. Right. And what's not in the frame actually matters a great deal as well, right? Off-screen space is very powerful. Mm -hmm. You ever hear that story about Polanski and Rosemary's Baby? Which one? This is the greatest. <laughs> yeah, this is one? this is a really about off-screen space. The uh -huh. greatest thing ever about oh, off-screen space. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So tell the story. Do, Maybe do, not everybody's heard. Well, Polanski, the cinematographer of the movie, is a guy named William Fraker, who was an excellent director of photography. And and uh, Polanski said, "Set up a shot of Ruth Gordon on the telephone. It's going to be Mia Farrow's point of view." And he walks away to talk to the actor. Fraker sets up a beautiful point of view shot of Ruth Gordon on a telephone down the hall with a long lens. Polanski comes back, he looks into the camera and he moves the camera two feet to the left. Fraker looks into the lens and he sees that the, the door is blocking 
uh, Ruth Gordon's face, you just see her back. Like, what the hell am I doing? This is a terrible shot. It looks a shot of Ruth Gordon's ass. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but I said, no, don't worry about it. Do it, shoot it, shoot it. It's going to be good. <laughs> so they shoot it. Months later, Fraker's at the premiere. And, Ruth, and Mia Farrow's looking down the hall, and it cuts to that shot of Ruth Gordon, and the whole audience goes like this, <laughs> <laughs> trying to see around the bend. Yeah. And uh, that tells you the power of what you don't see. Now, of course, and that's not off-screen space meaning off the camera, but it tells you the power of what you don't see. Yeah. So when you operate handheld camera, it's very essential. Hmm. Um, the, the scene we just watched, uh, what I like is that you don't see the, the wide shot until the end and you're right thrust into the nightclub and you yep. kind of feel their euphoria and you feel their excitement and their joy and then that turns into violence and then it's back into fun and it's right. all, you're in the mix of who these characters are right away and you're able to do that with you know, very close uh, cinematography and I, I just, that's an interesting choice as well. To well, make. that's stolen from, oh, okay. and, not, and I didn't do it as well. Mm -hmm. I mentioned this, I think, last night from a movie called I Am Cuba, Soy Cuba, uh, yeah, yeah. by Mikhail Kalazatov, yeah. which um, there's an incredible sequence early in the film in a, a nightclub in Havana where this young woman who's basically been forced into prostitution and these rich Americans who are all these businessmen and they're wearing these aviator sunglasses. You can never see their face. And they push her from character to character. Yeah. They're, they're, they're using her as a prop. As a, it's tragic. It's really very powerful. And I was trying to steal from that, and of course didn't do it as well, which is mm -hmm. why it becomes its own thing, right? Mm -hmm. you, yeah, I once said to a filmmaker, uh, oh, I've stolen so much from you, and he said, that's what it's there for. Nice. Which I thought was the greatest answer. That's great. Who was the filmmaker? Francis Coppola. Ah. <laughs> I said, I stole so many. He says, well, that's what it's there for. <laughs> oh, Who else can you do? Perfect I'm just answer. curious. <laughs> I can do everybody now. <laughs> All right, good. I'm going to see if we can. Uh, well, these get guys some more are my later. heroes, so yeah. I have to sort of try and perfect them. Yeah. I've never, of course, done the impression to them. Oh, I really? think that it would be a bad scene. I would love to see you do that to Marty Scorsese. Not be good. <laughs> oh, it would not be good. Well, maybe he might, he might like it. He might like it. Okay. Um, I understand that The Yards is one of your favorite films of the films that you've made. Is it? I'm not sure that's true. Okay, well, you well said no, it to that's an a really. At one point. Well, I'll tell you. I, it's, you can uh, revise. I, I'll, I'll answer. <laughs> uh -huh. but I, I have. Uh, a lot of problems with it, um, mm. but I can't separate myself from the experience of having made it. Mm. It's Which was what? very difficult. I mean, it was a very hard fight. Mm. Um, I, what I will say is that it has one of my favorite things that I've done in it, which is there's this fight between Mark Wahlberg and Joaquin Phoenix in the street, yeah. which is... I mean, it's really them going at it. Yeah. And it's the opposite, I think, of the movie fights with this and that. Because I was trying to do an, a, you know, a, the Marty Scorsese, like, obsessed with detail thing. And um, they used to have, there was a bar uh, called Gantry's Pub not too far from my house. And there was always a fight. Mm. Every Friday and Saturday night, 11 or 12 at night, like clockwork, there was a fight. And it spilled out onto the street. And it was never, it was full of, punches that never really fully connected, and wrestling and mm. ugly and not choreographed. And um, I think that they got it right. They were both really hurt in it, too. Yeah, those aren't stuntmen. Uh, no, it's those not, are, not stuntmen. Really it's yeah. uh, one take I got. Uh, Joaquin bashed his head on the concrete really yeah, badly. Yeah, because they fall down on the sidewalk. Yeah, no, it's bad. <laughs> it's bad. And the stunt coordinator was like, he, it was so funny because he was doing the whole thing with them like, okay, Mark, Mark. Then you throw a right, okay? <laughs> Walk, you duck, right? <laughs> then you come at him with an uppercut. And I see both Mark and Walk, and they're going like this. Mark's like, you know, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. Mark King's like, I'm not going to do that. And then I had, I had four cameras, I'll never forget, which I don't generally like to do, mm. but it was it's such a different, uh, the, each shot was so different that you could actually light for each one mm -hmm. and set one up really for the composition. There were four cameras set up up and down the street. I called action, I got one take and they just beat the hell out of each other. Yeah. And you see every, the, all of it in the movie mm -hmm. and it's very undramatic mm -hmm. in, a, in a kind of odd way. And I remember uh, Harvey Weinstein watching it and saying, um, God, I never forget, I went up to his office and he went like this. 
That was the worst fucking fight scene in the history of <laughs> fucking movies. I said, what do you mean? He goes, they're not actually fighting. What the fuck are they doing? What the fuck are they doing? I'm like, well, no, that's just like the fights I used to see when I was getting. He goes, I don't care. Go back and reshoot close-ups where they're getting into it and punching. And then he's telling me to get mm -hmm. exactly what I tried not to get. Right, yeah. And at that moment, I realized I was in big trouble. Hmm. And so the movie uh, also was my attempt at exploring something that felt very personal, still does feel very personal to me, which is this idea of the humiliation behind class differences. Hmm. You know, that, like, I found a great affection for very small things, like Mark uh, and Ellen drive up to uh, James Kahn's house, which is this huge, great house, and the look on his face and her face and how they have to kind of behave in a bigger house, and he lives in this kind of working-class house, at best described as working-class, and uh, apartment, and um, I just thought that that was something uh, very powerful to me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to communicate in the film, and that's not a commercial idea. Right. Because the whole United States, uh, countries yeah. live and die by collective myths. The American myth is Horatio Alger, right? If you don't work hard enough and you'll play by the rules, you can really get somewhere. Hmm. And actually, the United States is the second worst behind Britain country in social mobility in the industrialized world. Hmm. So it's a lot. You wouldn't know it from the movies, though. You would not, right? So I was trying to do something that was kind of about that in some indirect way, and I don't think it was something people didn't warm up to, or maybe it wasn't clear enough, or maybe it was too dark, or maybe it just wasn't good enough. I don't know. But it's there, not giving us the fantasy that we want from the movies, it's not. which is that it's you know it's the fantasy, it's the Scarface fantasy, right? You can come to absolutely. America with nothing and become uh, you rich can become, and absolutely uh, psychopathic. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I you know I always and I loved Joaquin in it because you know I found his character very tragic. I mean, she mm -hmm. dies at his, by his hand, but it's an accident, really. Mm. And mm. he is homeless, basically, rootless, and he's trying to fit into this other system, which he's never going to be able to do, and I felt great sympathy for his character. And maybe that's why I forged that uh, creative partnership with him, mm -hmm. because I had such an affection also for that character. I want to ask you more about Joaquin. Yep. Uh, you made four films with him. Yep. Uh, he's one of cinema's most remarkable he's great. actors, and I think you've brought out probably some of his best ever performances. Two Lovers especially is one of my favorites of it's yours. Incredible performance. He's so good in it so and good. so variable, so mercurial from scene yeah. to scene. Um, but he's a bit of an enigma, I think, to audiences. And yeah. because he, he, he kind of, we don't know that much about him. He's not one of those actors who plays the celebrity role well at all. He's, he's committed to his craft. Um, having worked with him as long as you have, who is he? Well, uh, I, I think uh, Joaquin is a bit of a throwback, uh, not to the actors of the 30s, but if you look at the history of uh, the cinema, American cinema particularly, um, it's interesting how the style or the form of the cinema is in part informed by the evolution of acting in the cinema. It's not really a director-driven evolution. In other words, when you had filmic representational acting, which is what you know, Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman are doing and mm -hmm. doing brilliantly well. These are some of my favorite movies ever. Mm -hmm. But there is an artificiality to it. Sure. Uh, and when they were shooting those films, you know, for example, Notorious, I was talking about this just the other night, maybe it was last night, where Hitchcock could storyboard every shot of the movie and the cinematographer could put marks on the floor, and Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman no doubt would hit the marks, and they could do have a driving scene with a fake background, and everyone would buy it. And it oh, you wouldn't buy it, but you'd accept it. Fine, that's it's what a movies convention. have. It's yeah. a convention. They have that. Fine, you deal with it. And then, uh, I will answer your question about Joaquin, but it, it, it needs this pre, you know, peroration. The, the, uh, the thing about the method, which gets a 
a kind of bad rap, but I think is really the best thing that ever happened to the movies in many respects, is the director started to have to understand that the actor could surprise him or her, mm -hmm. that the actor could do things that were totally, not only unexpected, but were technically wrong or would screw up the technicians or whatever. It was a bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. And so when Brando reaches down to pick up the glove that Ava Marie Saint has dropped, all of a sudden, wait, did you have a mark for that? Or you know, did the, was the camera prepared to do And all of a sudden you realize, okay, now the style of movies can no longer be storyboarded down to the last drop. And if you notice in Hitchcock's work, he was not able to adapt to no. that style of acting. And if you look at Chopaz or Family Plot or yeah. Frenzy, there's something inherently quite wrong with them because mm -hmm. the style could no longer compete with the actor. Mm -hmm. So the actors drove, uh, and Kazan, of course, with Kazan's gr great help, and, and actually an underrated director named Fred Zinneman also mm -hmm. had a lot to do with this as well. Mm -hmm. Zinneman was, directed Monty Clift in a movie called The Search. Right. And there, it, it was a huge uh, leap forward, but it meant all of a sudden the establishment, the staging of the scene, and where the camera goes became a subtle and sometimes awkward compromise between where the actor feels that he wants or she feels he, she wants to go and what the director thinks is the best shot for the mm -hmm. scene. Because mm -hmm. you have to navigate that compromise. Is this making any sense? Yeah, so you're capturing the performance yeah. as opposed to Ex exactly. crafting it entirely. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So if you look at then the new Hollywood, 1967 we'll say until about 1980, Generously, I think it mm -hmm. ended around 75. Mm -hmm. But let's give it through 1980. The cinema has a very different style about it than it did in the studio era. 1980 happens. I think this is a very underrated year in terms of how much things changed. Mm -hmm. It's Raging Bull and Ordinary People. Raging Bull, Ordinary People, right. But there were other wonderful mm -hmm. films that year. The Elephant mm -hmm. Man is a beautiful yes. film, I mm -hmm. think. Um, and very interesting films, very daring films. Uh, even Bill Friedkin's movie Cruising is unbelievably daring and you can't believe it was made in a studio context. The movies change. In 1981, you have a very different kind of cinema. Overnight, hmm. you have Raiders of the Lost Ark, Chariots hmm. of Fire, a, a very different kind of movie. Again, sometimes can be genius. I mean, E.T. is a brilliant fable. Mm. Uh, I'm a big fan of Spielberg's work in general, but not everybody is Steven Spielberg. Not everybody can stage scenes the way that he can and could, and not everybody breathes that kind of emotion that he, that he can. And the acting from most American movies then begins a long, subtle, and sometimes not so subtle retreat mm. back into filmic representational, except without the great people that were right. in those movies. Huh. And interesting. Tom my, Cruise is more of a exactly. representative. Yeah. This is actually born, my theory about this, if I may bloviate a little more. Bloviate. My theory about this is borne out <laughs> mm -hmm. by the decline in the interest in acting school. Oh. Now, acting schools in New York, you know, that to learn you know, Stella Adler and Lee Strasberg and Sanford Miser and Milton Katselis and all these teachers who taught the craft of acting in different ways, but always coming back in a way to Stanislavski as some version of that. Nobody's going now. The attendance at those schools mm. is, is, is going through the floor. Really? And there was an article about it in the New York Times maybe about a year ago. And I found it totally expected because you find that the movies are no longer calling for that subtle compromise between what the actor brings to the scene and where the camera is. Mm. Because now, where are we? Stand in front of that green screen. Yeah. So in some ways, we've gone backwards. Now, look at the soundtracks to movies. 1933 or 34, let's say 1933, King Kong, Max Steiner does, uh, the, does the score. Max Steiner was a great, great composer, uh, along with Korngold and uh, some, uh, you know, uh, Rosa and some other people were really great. Uh, and even Bernard Herrmann scored in this tradition, which was to score uh, every moment in the movie. They had a lot of music in the movies, and also 
they were scoring the movies much like a kind of a, almost like a cartoon, dare I say. Mm -hmm. So Bugs Bunny walks up the stairs, walks down the stairs. Then the new Hollywood comes. And I've used this example before, but it is illustrative in a major way. Clemenza goes to take Pauli to get killed, right? Leave the gun, take the cannolis. Very famous scene. Nino Rota does that score. The guy gets shot in a wide shot. Mm -hmm. And then the camera, cu you cut, the Francis cuts to a shot of the back of Cas Richard Castellano's head as he kind of jerks after he's finished urinating. And then you hear, the theme comes back, and it's a waltz. Why is there a waltz playing after somebody's been killed? It makes no sense <laughs> logically. But it, what it does is it's the music scoring a thematic idea. Yeah. That is what the new Hollywood brings, right? Then look what's happening now. Now with movies, no more method acting. Now it's filmic representational again in its own way. And look at the music. Now there's a hundred minutes of music in movies, generally routinely. They score everything like cartoons again. Mm -hmm. So in some way, the movies have regressed. And I'm insulting old movies, which I love maybe more than the new Hollywood. But I'm saying in terms of style. Now, Joaquin is from that period of the method. Now, if I called him a method actor to his face, he'd want to hit me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. He is an explosive, totally unpredictable presence on set in the best sense you know the cliché of uh, Diaghilev's quote, étonnez-moi, surprise yeah. me. I was shooting this scene in The Immigrant, and, uh, which I am a weird person about, because I think that is the performance that I think is really astonishing, mm -hmm. because it's, it, he's so horrible, uh, but I kind of feel for him or something in it. Mm -hmm. I, I, but he's everything is a lie that he does in the movies, lying to her constantly. Anyway, we were shooting this scene where uh, she has just stolen some money and he's going to confront her about it. And so the scene is scripted was like, you stole money from us or something. And he goes, all right, let's just do one. And I had the actress, uh, Dagmara Dominicic, who was off camera. Mm -hmm. and she, and I, I... So Joaquin came up to me and he said, just make sure everybody's in costume. I said, everyone's in costume? Yeah, everyone's in costume. What are you talking about? He goes, all right. So I said, action. Actually, I didn't say action. I never do. The assistant director said action. But he plays the scene. And he says, you stole from us. And he starts yelling at her. It starts improvising. And then he says, Belva. Belva, get in here. And Dagmara's like, I'm, I'm not, not in, in this scene. scene. <laughs> and all of a sudden, she walks into the scene. And she's like, <laughs> and he goes, what do we do, Belva? What do we do? Now, Dagmara, to her credit, played the moment and just kissed mm -hmm. uh, Marion, which makes no sense and all the sense <laughs> in the world. Yeah. I thought it was perfect. But it was all of a sudden like watching weird live theater or some kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, that is what I mean, because uh, an old-style cinematographer his or her hair would be on fire. Yeah. You'd have to All of a sudden this, the camera the goes like this and yeah. way off the thing and mm. the makeup and hair people were killing me because <laughs> they, I didn't put last looks on Dagmara. I didn't know she was going to be in the scene. I said, well, tough shit. <laughs> uh, but that's the kind of actor he is mm. and you but die you knew, for those actors. You knew on set that you wanted to keep that, that take. Yeah. Yeah. Because okay. it was weird mm. and horrible. <laughs> and this weird great thing that she did too, that she kissed Marion. I thought, I don't understand that, but it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but there's tons of that stuff in the movie. And in Two Lovers too, he's doing it constantly. Yeah. Um, and I encourage it because it's, it's, it often leads to you know, shots that are cut into the movie that are slightly out of focus or not framed perfectly or whatever. But you live for it because it's the explosiveness and the unpredictability of, of authenticity. Hmm. Not reality, because that's not what we're going for, but, but authenticity. authenticity. Yeah. And I forged a very close relationship with him after the Yards because I, I recognized that he really was into that sort of thing, and that was the kind of thing that made it worthwhile going hmm. to work in the morning. Hmm. 
we have a clip, probably one of the most famous scenes in your films from We Own the Night. It's the car chase scene, uh -huh. which is a rather remarkable technical exercise. never heard about this <laughs> exercise. We should just look at it one more time, okay, if you don't mind. Okay, okay. Uh, but Joaquin is, of course, at the, the center of this. And, yes, he is, um, and hated doing it, by the way. Did you really? Well, I, I, I think we, it kind of worked out. No, it worked out, but <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was a ridiculous, I'll tell you this. All right, well, let's look at the scene from We Own the Night. All right. It was very boring to shoot. Was it? Yes. It doesn't look that way on screen. Because you, you had a close-up of eyes. You'd say action. <laughs> but close-up of Joaquin. Joaquin hated doing this really? sequence. Well, by but the way, it is, it is it's spectacular. Hard well, thank I you. mean, it, the complexity of this sequence, the, you know, just uh, graphically, you know, the, the, the cuts between the extreme close-up and the, the overhead right. wide shots, the moving camera, that expressionist sound design with the rain, and I understand the rain was all a it's lot all of fake. effects, right? Yeah. There's so much going on in that sequence, but it does still serve the purpose of the story. You're with him all the time, and you, you actually feel fear for him, which is rare in action sequences these days, where you don't feel like anything's at stake. Yeah. But you do here. Well, thank you. Uh, it's, I think it's a failure as an action sequence because mm. it's, a, it's about his impotence. Mm. I mean, he can't act at all, and his father dies, and he can't really do anything about it, which is not typical, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, even in The French Connection, which I think is just so brilliantly done, um, he does kill Marcel Bozoufi, mm -hmm. who shoots him in the back, actually, which mm. people don't seem to, you know, they don't really... It doesn't register as that. It's very dark. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you're quite right. It's a it's an outgrowth of the movie, though, because he, it's all about how the fates conspire to basically wreck his life. Yeah. And he, it's again very commercial. <laughs> uh, and he, he's this my, my favorite thing in that that we just watched. I would have to say is probably not what anybody else would like, which is the shot which I just saw now of Duval shooting, but it's through the windshield and from a distance and you kind of can't hear it uh, because it's like, here's this scene and it's a nominally, I guess, an action sequence, but, but uh, he can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that, I thought, oh, that'll be really subversive and cool and then, you know, as usually is the case, you know, people, people are like, well, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> I remember we previewed the movie, God. We previewed the movie. I'll never forget this in Pasadena. The picture did okay, actually, the preview, weirdly enough. But that scene, they were like, that sucked. Because it's really slow, and he doesn't really do anything. And Re They want heroic action and in that kind of thing. you just realize that if it doesn't fulfill the expectations, sometimes you're in trouble. Hmm. You know? And that doesn't. Because he doesn't kill the bad guy at the end of that sequence. Right. They get away, and then his father dies, and you know, and he's miserable. Do you, do you think audiences want that? They want their expectations fulfilled. They want an action sequence to be about the hero coming out on top. It's a very good question. I would say that you know, I just recently read something that was sent to me by a, a friend of mine about Paul Schrader, uh, where he was uh, saying that there are a lot of great filmmakers. What there isn't now is a good audience or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that didn't get the best response, well, as I recall. <laughs> I, I, it would be easy for me to say I don't agree so that I could be popular and everyone would love me, but it's mm -hmm. also easy for me to say I do agree because that's Paul Schrader and he's a genius. But my opinion on it is somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. because I feel that you can't ask people to respond to something when they don't get anything like it ever. So if you're going to screen the movie for somebody in Oklahoma or something, and then you're pissed off because they're not smart enough to get your movie, there's no chance that someone living in Tulsa will get, in a, in a, in a multiplex, mm -hmm. will get to watch, uh, you know, Kurostami. You know, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So how can you expect more from them? And to expect more from them is in a way elitist, right? Because mm -hmm. you've I got a 
fantastic education. I, I grew up in New York City in the late 70s, early 80s. There were all these revival houses. I would cut school and go to see, you know, uh, Gira the Wrath of God. That's mm -hmm. an education. Mm -hmm. And that's not what somebody who lives 200 miles outside of Minneapolis can get. So you can't expect the audience to be accepting. I've used this analogy as well, but if you give somebody McDonald's every day, and then you give them salmon sushi, their reaction is not going to be that salmon sushi is the greatest thing they ever ate. Mm. Their reaction is to be, well, what is that? Right. Well, what is that? Is that like a, that's like raw? <laughs> <laughs> Which was my reaction when I first ate sushi. Okay. So uh, my feeling is that the problem is there was all this uh, prediction in the early 80s, and uh, I, don't, I don't know your, per your history at all, but... Mm. Maybe you'll recall there was all this arguing, arguing that, that multiplexes would be great because you would get all yeah. kinds of movies playing. Uh, George mm -hmm. Lucas made this argument. Yep. And everyone said, it'll be great because in theater one, you will have Empire Strikes Back. And in theater two, you will have Maya Darren. And in theater three... <laughs> and Actually, we do that sometimes here. Thank God you do. <laughs> thank God you do here. But guess what happened? Mm. Theater one had Aquaman, theater two had Aquaman, and in theater three, they're mm. proud to present Aquaman. <laughs> and in theater four, they have Aquaman in IMAX. <laughs> so you don't have, this, the audience is not able to be inculcated, and they, they're not able to be brought along to another kind of cinema. The answer, I think, is mandating uh, art education of some kind in high schools, and yes, including cinema in that. Like because God from your lips to God's ear. But, but right? it doesn't happen, right? Because so everyone says, you, what, you show a movie in school? <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. I mean, sometimes you can show a movie in school, man. And learn you can something. Do it and learn something, you know? Yeah. And obviously, you know, you show a ninth grader, if you show a ninth grader memories of underdevelopment, their reaction's not going to be that it's the best movie ever. But that's okay. <laughs> Let them hate it at first. Mm. Show the 10th grader the conformist. Mm -hmm. They will hate it. <laughs> but that's okay. Maybe, so, maybe A, maybe it'll rub off on 20% of the class. That's still a high number. Yep. B, maybe it'll rub off on nobody. But maybe they'll think, well, there's another kind of thing out there. Mm. Right now, they don't even know about it. Yeah. So are audiences accepting? No. But can I blame them? Not really. Mm -hmm. And the audience that actually, and uh, the audience, there is an audience that's accepting. Now they stay home because they have excellent home systems. Mm -hmm. So I get, uh, this sounds self aggrandizing, but it's true. I get a fair amount of fan stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's always from people who say, I saw your movie uh, at home on the big screen. Don't worry, it was big. And they always mm -hmm. say that. And somehow I missed it in the movie theater. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you missed it in the movie theater. Because you're out of the habit of going. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. So let me ask you this then. If that's the case, you, you shoot, you've shot everything, as I recall, on 35 millimeter. Your movies are made for the big screen. There's so much detail and complexity in the image. Uh, do we lose anything when yeah. we watch it at home? Absolutely. Okay. So I, I got very depressed about Lost City of, of Zed. Call <laughs> and uh, see, it's fine. Well, I, I had to, uh, No, you're right. It's Zed. Um, <laughs> I had, Darius Kanji and I had framed it obsessively for a big screen experience. We were trying to channel David Lean f to some degree, and our idea was to start as a David Lean movie and then have that kind of colonialism turn into rot and mm. kind of fall apart a little. And then he has this weird relationship with his son, and then by the end, he's had to let go of all of that. And anyway, that was the design of it. And I'll never forget this. I was... I, I mentioned this last night. I was on a plane flight back from New York to L.A., and I saw the movie playing on two screens oh. on the back of seats. <laughs> and the, my first reaction was, oh, they're watching that. And then I thought, they're watching that <laughs> on a TV screen that's this big. Yeah. And I went to the goddamn jungle. <laughs> There's something very weird about that. You know, I went to the jungle. We went to the jungle. And it was horrible. It was really horrible. Mm. And I thought, you know, 
I'm going to I'm going to do it. I'm going to be like one of my heroes or like Francis or like uh, Van der Herzog, Herzog or yeah. one of these guys and I'm going to go and I'm going to do it and it was as bad as I had thought. <laughs> and and uh, you know, we managed to get all the film back and developed and all that and then all of that richness I thought was totally gone mm. by the time it made that kind of a screen. Now, I had a very funny meeting with a wonderful actor named Alexander Skarsgård. And he had just finished shooting Tarzan. And uh, he was like, oh, no, it was a great shoot. We shot in London. It was fantastic. You know, it was some pine <laughs> I was like, really? He's like, yeah. I said, isn't this supposed to be like, like the Congo or something? Yeah. Where is this supposed to take Tarzan that? didn't go to the jungle. He didn't go to the jungle. <laughs> the jungle came to Tarzan. <laughs> and they shot in a, on a soundstage. Uh, uh, in London, and he was like, no, it's great, you know, I sleep in Covent Garden Hotel, it's fantastic, the service is great. <laughs> and I had just, conversely, gotten back from Colombia, like, two nights before, and I'm thinking, man, who's the schmuck here? <laughs> because you can't really, ultimately, it doesn't matter, you know, you're not going to see it on the big screen. I mean, you, you can, watch the two movies, I no, think you know. No, you can't, dude, I wish, I wish you could. <laughs> You know, I can tell you tons of stories about the caimans and the snakes and the things like that. You know, in the end, maybe I just should have had Charlie and Rob stand in front of a green screen, you know? Nah. And gone like, monkey, drop shit on your head, go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let's go back to Sorry. something maybe a little less... Uh, Exotic in terms of his location. We're talking about a rooftop in uh, New York Borough, which is actually has a bunch of scenes uh, on rooftops in um, Queens and, and Brooklyn. Uh, this is from Two Lovers. Uh -huh. And um, a much more intimate story, I think, compared to some of the crime films you'd made up to this point. Um, and you've got, um, you've got uh, Joaquin Phoenix and, and Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, and there's a third person in this uh, story as well. And I like what I like about the title is that two lovers can refer to right anybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to have a look at the scene and then ask you a little bit about how you put that scene together because it's very interesting visually in terms of the um, the blocking and cinematography, but the performances as well. So let's look at this scene from Two Lovers. Oh, it's funny you, uh, you you looked at that scene. I, I hadn't. I, it's been a while because I. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen that movie too. Um, um, I remember shooting that. That's take thirty-three. Is it? Yeah, I did thirty-three takes on the ro on the roof, and uh, but that's the kind of thing you can do with actors who can do it. And I could have used one of maybe twenty. Really? Uh, I they were playing and doing really great. I, I'm gonna tell you this and. I don't know. I don't. I, I know that she's got a whole lifestyle thing, goop, and all that. <laughs> that is an unbelievably talented person, mm -hmm. and I mean, great. She is as good an actor as I have ever worked with mm -hmm. on the nuts and bolts of acting. And to me, I mean, she she would she's probably going to get angry at me, but uh, to, for me, it's a bit of a sadness that she hasn't used that instrument, mm -hmm. and she doesn't love it as much as I do um, because she was doing every bit as interesting stuff as Joaquin. Mm -hmm. Joaquin loved her I mean, she was great to work with and he was just unbelievably inventive and most of that's improvised and uh, I had I think the first 12 or 13, 14 takes, something like that, was working out the choreography which was oh, pretty yeah. elaborate. Yeah, it looks like I mean, it's it. It's very elaborate because the camera's doing all this weird stuff and then I think from then on, I had a very good take. I want to, if my, my, it's been a while now, but I, my memory serves, I think take 14 or 15 was very good. And then I just said, well, should we move on? No. Take 16, really good, but very different. Take 17, really good, but very different. And that's the last take we did. It was 33. And then I said, we've done enough. That's fabulous. And I loved what they did. <laughs> And it was weird the way he comes back in. He goes, tell Ronald, which is like, like <laughs> almost becomes like a nine-year-old kid. And he has that awful that's perfect. jacket. He, he's so wounded at he's that so point. He's so wounded though. and pathetic. And yeah. she says, I just want you to be my friend, which is awful. It's the worst thing to say. And it. any guy who's been with a woman who he likes, and that's who it is, I want, I want you to be my good friend. It's like, no. Um, I, found, I find that movie to be 
crazily sad. I mean, mm -hmm. I hadn't seen it in a while. Um, this clip was sent to me by you guys. I said, oh, God. And just looking <laughs> at it, looking at it recalled all this stuff, and I have no idea why I made it, because at that moment in my life, I was already uh, married with, at the time, two kids, and absolutely happy as heck. Mm -hmm. And so I have no idea where it came from. But it was right after, it was made right after We Own the Night, and I wanted to go right into doing another movie because it had been so long for political reasons that I was able to make We Own the Night. It took so long because uh, I had arguments on the other movie. And um, it, it, the, last th uh, the last three pictures, uh, the, the Two Lovers and the Immigrant were both incredibly smooth shoots. Mm -hmm. um, and I really, I really loved uh, making both of those films. Mm. I want to ask you about the French because at a certain point the French discovered your films and this clip to me was interesting because there's so much cinema as the French would say you know the French will look at a movie and say that's cinema that's not cinema and to me there's so much cinema in this framing in terms of this film history there's you know cineasts could read references to The Searchers and lots of other films that use kind of uh, screen space in the way that you do in this movie. The camera movement, the performances, there's references I'd possibly to the 50s movies you were talking about when method acting became so big in, in American cinema. All of that's there, but not explicitly kind of shouted out, but it's kind of stitched into the fabric of the film. And I can see why French critics and cinephiles really responded as well as they have to your films. But I, I guess I wonder, you know, how do you feel about that? Does it feel like they're getting your movies maybe more than other audiences are? Or does it feel like they're misreading, perhaps? They, they the French critics, for reasons I'm not entirely certain of, actually su have supported me really since the first movie that I did. When I did, uh, when I showed Little Odessa after Venice, I went to Deauville mm. and it was like insane. I was like, I'd never seen anything like it, that mm. press conference. And I was, like, as you said, I was at, by that time I was 24, but I was like, I didn't know what was happening. Um, and I had all these people coming up to talk to me and I don't understand exactly why they respond the way they do to the films. They always have, they still do. I'm eternally grateful for it because if you had to pick one country mm. Mm -hmm. that could love you, mm -hmm. if you're a movie maker, it would be <laughs> yeah, the French. That's France, yeah. Um, it's conversely, and it's very interesting, my absolute worst territory, review-wise, critically, uh, is by far, by far the United Kingdom. Really? Yeah. Uh, huh. my, my movies get terrible reviews there. Um, hmm. They're called worthless, stupid, moronic. Um, wow, that's In fact, odd. I had a huge, and I think it's absolutely awful of me to have done this. I mean, it's one of the stupidest things I've ever done. But I got into a squabble with a critic, which is so low. I mean, the idea that you, the critic has every right to write, however stupid, <laughs> anything he or she wants. <laughs> but, the, but what happened was, and it's a funny story, so I'll tell it to you. But, I was, and, but this is actually, it comes back to this can thing. Because the can, the festival does love me. Mm -hmm. And they've been incredibly supportive. But the film's screen very poorly there. Mm. Uh, when Two Lovers played, it was booed heartily. The I am the Susan Lucci of the Cannes competition. <laughs> I have Because I have had more movies, <laughs> okay. I have the record for the most mm. movies played in competition, in competition never having winning. won anything. Right. Now, the first time I showed a movie, I was really excited to like win everything because that's what I thought it was about. Now, I, I honestly, I swear to God, I don't give a shit. The, uh, at the time, I was really deprived, I didn't win or whatever. Um, but, it's, but you realize why the boos come, because the British have a very outsized uh, influence, actually in, critically in Cannes, mm -hmm. um, and they have always led the chorus, and the Americans w used to follow suit. It's, it's changed quite a bit. The last, with Two Lovers, something happened. Uh, the reviews became very good, and I've been treated very well now, I would say, critically. Uh, in the United States. Hmm. And in fact, I now get uh, more fan stuff from the US than I do from France, which okay. is, which is, yeah. But, but I'm eternally grateful to them. Do, do they, do I, I, and I've started learning to hate it, actually, because oh, really? 
there's a certain level of derision when people say it, you know, not, not from you, but when some people say, like, oh, the French like you, right? <laughs> like, I'm Jerry Lewis or something, and it's like, you know, lady, you know, or some right, weird yeah. thing like that, and, you know, and... Not that there's anything wrong with Jerry no, Lewis. No, by the way, I love Jerry Lewis, but you know what I mean. Like, yeah, it's sure. a way to no, marginalize you and make you into, like, some, you know, circus act, some shithead who doesn't really have anything, and they, ha-ha, they're so stupid, the French. But I will say this, their track record's pretty good. Yeah. So I'll live with it now. Uh, and I think that uh, I've been fortunate to have their support because, frankly, if I didn't have them, they put up the money for Two Lovers and the Immigrant and mm -hmm. a lot for Z. Mm -hmm. Zed. So uh, <laughs> thank God they've been around. That's right. Vive la France. Um, we have, I want to show two clips back to back next. Yeah, because um, I'm talking too much. No, I'm loving the conversation, but I let, let's watch a clip from The Immigrant, which is... Uh, um, a scene with a pair of scissors, which I like, uh, and then a, a scene from the Lost City of Z, uh, the train scene. We'll, sh we'll show those back to back. I want to talk a little bit about the, the kind of the growing scale of your films. I was saying as we were watching that clip, that's my favorite piece that I've ever done in my life, having nothing to do with me, though. It's because of that Ravel music, mm. which is from Daphnis and Chloe, suite number two, and you put it on me taking out the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> that music is so incredible to me. Mm. Anyway, sorry. Uh, no, that's... Love that music so much. That's stolen, by the way, from a Fellini movie called Evie Taloni that, oh, okay. that cuts to the end in bed. Yeah. I ripped it off completely. It's the ending of Evie Taloni, which I just ruined for some people who haven't seen it. To my <laughs> Spoiler <laughs> alert. Um, so yeah, I was going to ask about about scale. Uh, your um, your films uh, have, I think, not just uh, shifted in terms of the periods that they're dealing with. You're going sort of further back in time in a way in uh, the Immigrant and Lost City of Z. Um, you're you've got a sort of larger canvas. You're going to the jungle in some cases. Um, is that just a matter of just new resources coming up to, uh, uh, available to you in terms of you know the scale of the movies you can make, or is your imagination taking you in different places now? It has nothing to do with the resources available to me. The Immigrant okay. was made for $12 million. Okay. Uh, I would, it was 29 shooting days. Or, uh, it was not, not I didn't have a ton movie. of resources, no. Okay. And Lost City of Zed <laughs> was also you know, fairly cheap. It was, you know, I think we spent $19 million on it, but then with the tax breaks, we got up to like 30 or something. But that's not huge budgets, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, wanted to make movies that were relying on the crime genre less. And so mm -hmm. Two Lovers was the first attempt at that. And then uh, I've tried to branch out from that. I, I kind of don't want to make the same movie over and over again. Mm -hmm. I mean, you kind of do. It's weird. Of you course make you the do. Same, you yes. want to make, you know, <laughs> yeah. you make the same movie thematically. Yeah. You want to make the same movie in, in, in that it's a expression of a personal, it's a, it's a personal expression. But what you don't want to do is make it with the same costume. Sure. You know? All right. So you, you're enough of a cinephile yourself to have studied many other directors and to have, an, I think, enough self-awareness of your own work to maybe be able to identify or define what is the movie you're making over and over again thematically. Wow. It's a dangerous question. I know. You, you say answer, it out loud. You right? answer that question, and then all of a sudden you're doing it. It's conscious. <laughs> well, I would hope that there are things that I'm doing over and over that I'm not aware of. I would hope that that's the case. But I am interested in certain things over and over again. I'm interested in, in fathers and sons. I'm interested in the idea of destiny, in a way. I'm interested in and how that connects a modern reading of destiny, not in some kind of... Uh, you know, ancient Greek way, but meaning that our ability to change our lot is 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 very difficult, and 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 the class structure is very um, difficult to navigate. I would say that that's something that's appeared in all the movies, maybe less so in the movie I've I've just finished shooting, but that inability to escape. Um, to a large degree, what your background is, where you're from, who you are. The inability to recreate yourself, mm -hmm. I think, is a major idea behind all the movies, I think. That's tragedy. It's pretty dark. 
<laughs> but I mean, here's the thing. It's, not, it's dark, but it's not dark. I mean, would you say that the word depressing is the same thing as sad? I would no, not. No, absolutely not. No. A lot of people would equate the two. Yeah. But I, I think there's a, a beauty in sadness. That's absolutely. A, an acknowledgement that this is the way things are. And that's a part of life. You know, that's a part of life that's worth exploring in art, if I may use that dirty word. Mm -hmm. And if people have a problem with it, you know, I don't know what to say about it because, yes, there's a sadness to it. There's no question. But isn't that what it means to be a person? I mean, isn't that part of why we do this? Mm. You know, I, I again, I, I not to get too sententious about it, I've quoted this too many times, but George Eliot, the, the great writer, she said, the, the, the thing we owe the artist is the extension of our sympathies. Mm. You know, and, and there's something really beautiful about that, and I, I feel that... Look, in the end, we kind of can't beat the house. You know, we're all going to die. So, it's can I worth just ask you one stuff. thing on that point? Yeah. How how Russian are you? I'm really Russian, aren't I? Because I'll tell you, it's funny. I never thought about it consciously. In in college, I took a Russian literature class. Uh, it was a Dostoevsky class, and I really responded to it. Um. And then I read a lot of Tolstoy, and I really responded to it. The only American that I really respond to, other than Mark Twain, who I think is incredibly funny, um, is Melville. I, mm -hmm. I, I really love Melville. Mm -hmm. But Melville's got a lot in common with them. Melville's, I mean, Moby Dick is so tragic, that book. I find it so heartbreaking. And I guess that's the Russian in me, mm -hmm. because... And we're not funny. Russians are not funny. We're not. <laughs> well, you, you are funny. Well, I mean, in the work, you yeah, know. And, right. uh, Anna Karenina has no jokes. <laughs> thousand pages of no jokes. Imagine how much better it would be you with know? jokes. I think Tarkovsky's <laughs> not very funny, is he? No. No, but I, but I, 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 I facetious this aside, I guess you're right. It is a very Russian thing. You can't run from that. Look, if I, if I did something that didn't have that, then I think it would be a lie. You know, the whole, one of the other things, and it's a major thing that, that the new Hollywood did bequeath to me, that I saw in, in, in Marty's work and in Francis Coppola's work and in Friedkin's work and in Robert Altman's work and all these guys, who, Stanley Kubrick too, although he's not typically grouped with them, but was that the cinema can be and actually should be if you want to be uh, uh, trying to push the medium a little bit should be something, a means of personal expression of some kind. And if you don't put yourself into the work, what do you got? Mm -hmm. So I've tried to put myself into the work for better and for worse, mm -hmm. as we've discussed. I mean, you know, the car chase where no, he doesn't achieve anything, <laughs> that's putting myself into it, but it's not, it's, you know, that's a, there's a risk to that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. You know, uh, I mentioned Spielberg before who is maybe, other than James Cameron, I guess, I don't know, the most commercially successful director ever. But what's interesting about him and other directors who try to be him is that don't you sense a personal thing with him, with Spielberg? Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. sense a personal commitment to the work. I sense that his commerciality stems, weirdly, from a personal commitment. So I think that even in the case of the most commercially successful director, you got to be personal. You got to yeah. put yourself into the work. You yeah. got to feel Those the person, the man things. or the woman making it. All right. So, on that point, I want to end by asking you about Ad Astra, uh -huh. your next film, which we will see. I hope sometime later this year. We'll, we'll uh, find out where, when. But um, this stars Brad Pitt. Yeah, he's commercial great in the movie, presence. By the way. He's a terrific actor. He is as so well. good in the movie. It's crazy. Talk about personal commitment. I mean, he gave me everything on this. Yeah. He was great. I love him. So what can you tell us about the film, the stories? I of, can tell you the story. Okay. The story's not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm being silly, but, but that's not what makes any movie hopefully right. interesting. I mean, the story, if, if, if the story is interesting, it's probably pretty bad, or mm -hmm. it's a whodunit and has a limited shelf life, right. you know? 
So it's essentially a man looking for his father who's yeah, gone his father, missing in his space. His father may or may not be out there on right. Neptune doing very bad things, right. and they send him out there to communicate with him. And it's very heart of darkness. Hmm. It's sort of like if you got Apocalypse Now in 2001 in a giant mashup, and you put a little Conrad in there, and you hope it's as good, but it's probably not. Wow. No, I mean, I'm, that, but that, I'm, I'm, again, I'm being yeah, silly, but, sure. but that, that, that were they, those were the influences, and, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, it's space travel, but handled in a kind of, you know, you go to the moon, and there's a Hudson News where you buy your magazine, mm -hmm. and you, you know, Moon's Got Talent is the TV show, and, <laughs> you know, and... But there's also pirates on the moon, just like there are, in, you know, in the in the world we have, and the, you know, it's it's my attempt to kind of to treat that father son story, that Oedipal conflict, which is so central to Western culture, uh, in a hopefully a new way, um, and uh, you know, I guess I. It's no secret that the dad's alive because Tommy Lee Jones is in it and plays him, so you know mm. he's going to make an appearance. Mm. But uh, um, it was a real challenge to make the film because uh, I should say not in the past, it still is because I'm still working on it, because there's such a technical apparatus involved in it that I was not attuned to before, and I kind of want to get that right. You know, mm. I don't want it to be like, uh, the movie is effects are terrible. It just took me mm. right out. You know, I don't want it to be that. Mm. So, you know, there's a lunar rover sequence and that all has to look real and all that. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm being a bit of a bulldog and uh, hopefully it'll look really great. I mean, I, I, I definitely took some risks. But, That's great. Cannot uh, wait to see it. Yeah, I, I, it'll be done sometime in the next four years or so. <laughs> <laughs> I, have I have just, I realized though today, I got an email from uh, one of the editors and I just realized, oh my God. I have so much work left to do. I have like hundreds of shots to go through. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's a high class problem, but you still want to be finished. Yeah. You know, at some point you do. And I used to read about, the movie took two and a half years, man. I thought, like, what the hell's the problem? Why don't you just hurry up? And now here I am, and I shot mm -hmm. it a year ago, and I'm kind of not close to finished. And yeah. you realize why. Just these movies take they a take long time. time. Take your time. 2001 was four years in the That's making. Right. Yeah. Four years. Yeah. Nuts. All right, we're going to end this part of the conversation here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. For... I've loved this, by the oh, way. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, no, I have you, as well. The, the, uh, it's been great. And um, uh, like I said, it was excellent to, to get out of the house. So I, <laughs> and this is a great city. Already so. a win, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's see if we can bring the lights up a little bit. I want to throw it over to you now. And we've gone a little bit over time here. So we're, we're going to allow uh, plenty of time for some questions. Uh, plenty is, you know, reasonable uh, limit, of course, on that. Uh, but uh, we've got microphones, uh, I think, on both sides of the room. We will come to you. Let's start uh, with this gentleman right here, if we could. Me? Yes, you. Uh, but we've got a microphone. Do we have a mic that can go to him? Thank you. It's coming from behind you or beside you. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, I really enjoyed your conversation. I don't know if you can improvise and do Jim Carrey. <laughs> <laughs> um, you touched upon a lot of things that we're going to ask you. So I'll make this quick. Movies have evolved. Um, you know, I'm born in 71, so, you know, a lot of the early films, I, I, you know, Ghostbusters and all that were, for me, the wild movies. But moving forward, obviously a lot of movies now are, you know, CG and, you know, just not the way they were in the 70s like you were talking about. Uh, what, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think we'll have those method actors like Joachim to keep us going or... Where do you see it going? I know it's maybe a, maybe a bit of a tough question. No, no, it's an interesting question. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to say something you may like, but I, about 10 years ago I was doing an interview. Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly where, but, um, and I said, and I didn't remember having said this, but a writer friend of mine reminded me of this last year. And I had said, and this was, I think in 2004, I had said this, that the, I worried that the movies were like the opera. That if you look at the history of opera, there was this period where, you know, 400,000 people lined the streets for Verdi's funeral. Verdi was like, he was like 
the most, po he was like the Beatles plus Beyonce. Like he was huge. And the idea of an opera composer dying today mm -hmm. where 400,000 people would line the streets of whatever major city, never, right? The medium is essentially dead. If you look at what happened with opera, it, it, it went as follows. It became, a, a po it was a popular medium. Uh, at first, uh, with Mozart, it was a bit of an upper class thing, but people still went. Uh, b b b middle class people, what, what was then middle class people would have gone. Then it became very much a popular medium in the 19th century, particularly after Bel Canto, when you got into Verdi, and then with Puccini, it was a totally popular medium. And then all of a sudden, Puccini dies, 1925. Almost overnight, they make these like fascist operas um, uh, under Mussolini, a composer named Mascani, who actually his music is in Raging Bull, was making operas like Neroni, these huge spectacles where they spent a zillion dollars on it because that's the only way they would get people in. Is this sounding familiar? You're getting the allegory here? <laughs> now, before, listen to this. This is what's totally fascinating. Before they made these huge spectacles with Puccini, what was Puccini really interested in doing? And even Mascagni before the fascists took over. They were doing something called Verismo. What was Verismo? Verismo was, oh, we're going to make earthy, authentic operas about, like, working class people. La Boheme, for example. In other words, the new Hollywood. <laughs> and then they made the shitty spectacles. And after about 1930, the medium was dead. It was over. Look at what's happening now. I said this in 2004. If you look at what's happening now, the thing that is keeping the major studios in the United States afloat, if anything, and as we've seen with 20th Century Fox, the company that is, I guess, going to release Ad Astra, although they have been purchased now by Disney. So I don't know what that means for the film, to be honest. I think it'll be fine. And I'm sure Disney will do a great job, but it's strange. I mean, they're now the biggest company ever, and who knows what. They're focused exclusively now. Why did they do it? Because they wanted to get a streaming service. Streaming is much 45 million people watched a movie with, uh, a Netflix movie with Sandra Bullock uh, two weeks ago. 45 million. If that were opening weekend for a movie, you'd make $500 million. <laughs> So the economics, as you see, the economics are so different and so out of whack that I fear for the history, I fear, looking at the history, I fear for the medium. And what I think will happen is that you'll begin to see a consolidation where studios will make two or three movies each. They will each cost three or four hundred, five hundred million dollars. They'll be unbelievable spectaculars in 5D, 6D, 8D, 96D. They'll have, the screen will come over your head, behind your head, inside, up your ass. There'll be a screen everywhere. It'll be the greatest sound ever. And then there'll be the rest of us at home watching the movie made for two cents on somebody's new, the, the iPhone XXX, which has, you know, 4K, whatever, 8K, 9K, 200K. And that'll be it. And then there'll be like 150 of us who play our vinyl records, who, who like, who watch like, you ever see that movie by uh, uh, Oshima, Boy, 1966, really good. And they'll have like hair standing up on one end and carrying around <laughs> shopping bags, verging on homeless, you know. So uh, wow. I do think that if you look at the medium, that is rather inescapably where we're headed. Those are the economics. Now, is it possible that Netflix and Amazon and other places like that will lead to some explosion of talent? Yes, it is. So that's great. And let me tell you, I just was in Marrakesh where I was heading up the jury of a film festival there. And the quality of the movies I saw, I saw 14 movies, and the quality was unbelievable. So it's bizarre because now I feel like there are all these people who are being mm -hmm. exposed to the cinema and there's going to be all these new voices and basically, 51% of the population never had a voice at all, right? And now, all of a sudden, half the movies I saw in Marrakesh were by women. And they were all great. And this, at this moment now, they're not going to be able to have people to watch them. Hmm. So, on the one hand, I have this terrible pessimism about the medium. But, if there is to be hope, there is this hope that comes from the creative people the people that are making the films, people who now have a voice, and that is astonishing. Now, you asked me about 35-millimeter film. 
And in the past, I've talked about how great it is and how much better it is than digital. And it is. There is no argument. I won't tolerate bullshit from people <laughs> telling me about how great digital is. For 35 millimeter film, when you put it up against digital, is better. I'm sorry, it is better. But I'm angry at myself for making that argument because what I have come to learn and come to listen, others tell me this, and I have to come to their side of the argument. It democratizes the medium. It's much cheaper. It's an elitist argument to talk about 35 because it was so expensive and it was restrictive to people. And I saw all these beautiful films made by people who probably couldn't have made films on film. So I should go fuck myself for talking about how great 35 <laughs> million is. It's a difficult position to be in. So I think the history of the cinema is rather dire. Because I think there are other things like virtual reality that will supplant it. And people are watching movies on their telephone. Now, is that wrong? I think it is, but who am I to say? That's how people watch them now. So am I wrong? I'm, I, I, I look at people, it's like if somebody came back from 150 years ago, I'm talking about Melville, you know, where Scrimshaw carving into mm. I, you know, ivory was such a valued skill set. It's like me going, bring back the Scrimshaw. It's like, what? <laughs> it's over, dude. So, okay. Um, where's Sorry. the next, right here is the next, uh, uh, who's, you have the mic already. Go ahead, please. Uh, so following last night's screening of The Yards, you were asked about your working relationship with Harris Savitas, and you talked about the work you did in terms of muddying the film print. You mentioned uh, leaving it in your oven for eight hours to yeah. bring down the film emulsion. So I was curious to hear more about other work you've done on your other movies in terms of getting a certain look. Yeah. Uh, it's been very difficult because the stocks are now so indestructible. And it's weird because the, the Kodak, what shell of a company has left, it's very sad. You know, digital was invented by Kodak Labs in oh, 1972. Yeah. Hmm. And the guy who developed it came to the head of Kodak and he said, look at this. And the head of Kodak said, why would I ever want to pursue this? It looks horrible <laughs> and it's more expensive than film. And he was right. And at the same time, it meant the end of the company. It's the only time in the entire history of industry that I can think of where a company went bankrupt, essentially, making a product that was both better and cheaper. I can think of better, but not cheaper. I can think of cheaper, but not better. Not both. And now what Kodak has done is they have attempted to manufacture stocks which will respond well to the digital process, digital intermediates, uh, and, and being scanned which is not the same thing as finishing on film. You know, Chris Nolan, who I think is just a lovely guy, and I love him to death for being dedicated to the cinema and to film, uh, is very dogmatic about it, uh, about finishing on film, so much so that he still cuts negative. I don't do that. I shoot on film and then I have it scanned, and he looks at me and he talks to me like I'm, you know, like I'm, it's like I'm, I'm, you know, the poor redheaded stepchild idiot doing this thing. Like, are you telling me you didn't cut negative? Like, no, I didn't. But what's the point of watching a print then? It's only made from a 4K scan. <laughs> now, by the way, I, I, I'm making jokes at his expense, but A, I love him, and B, it's great that he's doing that because he is almost single-handedly, along with Quentin Tarantino and P.T. Anderson, a couple of people like that, keeping and Spielberg, and a couple other people, uh, keeping the medium alive, you have to beat up the film any way that you can. And each film is presented a different challenge as they create new stocks or as they develop new stocks because they respond very differently. So uh, I, re I remember on the yards, for example, we had to you know, push the stock uh, and really underexpose everything in order to look the way we wanted. And then the new stocks came in. Then on We on the Nine, I remember we had to pull two stops, like do the opposite in order to get it to look the way I want it. Look, you know, it's been very difficult. And I don't know the answer now. What I tried to do uh, on the last two pictures, along with, um, I know uh, Paul, Anderson, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson has also tried to push for this, but it's like developing old stocks again, having them bring back, since they're a boutique company anyway, right. To bring vintage back stock, vintage stock, right. Yeah. So in other words, to ma start manufacturing 5247, which was, you know, I, I think with the Ophimbia, that's 5263, what they shot Barry Lyndon on, for example, which was mm -hmm. a fairly slow stock, but it has a grain structure, which is really amazing and very painterly. 
well, I think I also shot The Godfather on that stock. The, the Kodak can't do it. It's millions and millions and millions of dollars. They got to retool. It's like not something where you just flick a switch. It's a whole different, you know, batch of chemical, a whole different machining process. And so you realize you're hostage to the technology. And it's unlike any other art form. If I were a painter, which I wish I were, <laughs> and dreamed about being, and I had my tube of cadmium, you know, there was there's cadmium red and cadmium yellow you mm. paint with. And cadmium red, you cannot get cadmium red, cadmium yellow. If you take out cadmium, the paint, the, the yellow and the red does not look as good. It just doesn't. And there was all, you know, but it also happens to be terrible for the environment. But it's such a niche industry that in the United States, they made a rule that, you know, it's okay, you can use cadmium in, the, in oil paints. But it's like taking away that tool you have. I can't, if I wanted to, shoot a movie in black and white on film. I couldn't. They don't make that stock. You know, uh, Alfonso did it with, the, with digital the, and all that, yeah. but... It doesn't look the same. Hmm. So, uh, I mean, it's become something else, something beautiful, but it's not that thing. So you have to find your way with the tools that you're given, and that is a slight frustration. It would be like somebody saying, that fan brush, you can't use it anymore. Hmm. And that kind of sucks. All right. We got a lot of questions here. Let's, let's try something. Let's get um, two questions back to back, and maybe there's some okay. connection, and we'll see if we can answer both. Who's next? Right here? Yeah, you uh, mentioned your Russian heritage and uh, the, the classics, no jokes, but <laughs> you didn't mention Nikolai Gogol, who's hilarious. Yeah, he is. The uh, um, Diary of a Madman is the, both the funniest and the saddest story I've ever read. And you're clearly a funny guy. Have you um, had any um, inclination or, or interest in maybe putting your unique stamp on a comedy? Okay, so one question, comedy, and the other, who's next, right here, with a microphone? Yeah, well, I guess my question is about uh, screenwriting. I'm just wondering, when you start a screenplay, do you have like a process or a routine that you keep when you start a project? All right. Okay. Comedy, so, screenwriting. Uh, I, I have, may have very little talent for cinema in general. I have even less talent for comedy in movies, <laughs> because I'm going to tell you that I think, and I'm alone in this, when I was making Two Lovers, I thought it was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I would sit there, and there's a scene where Joaquin Phoenix goes to this restaurant, which was called San Domenico. It's gone now, off Central Park. It was a very fancy restaurant for him. And he was sitting there doing all the stuff, like, sir, I can bring you real straw. And he's doing all this <laughs> yes, stuff, and the thing yeah. like, looks like it's coming out of his head, and it's awkward as hell. And the guy gets the menu and goes, oh, they brought me a menu. I don't know if it's different, which is absurd. <laughs> and I'm laughing and laughing and laughing. And I screen them the picture for the first time, and everyone says, that's the saddest movie I've ever seen. And I say, oh, shit, I have no skill with it all, because if I'm laughing and nobody else is, I'm, I'm screwed. I'm telling you, another thing, I, when I did The Immigrant, I find Joaquin's show with the women so funny and so stupid and so ridiculous, and people are like, yeah, no, that's the least funny movie I've ever seen in my life. So I'm never going to do it, because if I did, it would be... And I'm telling you, I don't have a good sense of humor, because I just showed Dr. Strangelove to my son and my daughter, my elder son and, and my daughter. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, I thought the movie, which I hadn't seen for quite, while, quite a while, was every bit as good as I'd remembered, if not better, and I didn't think it was funny at all. Hmm. I found it unbelievably upsetting. I found it weirdly, like, accurate in some way. <laughs> yes. Like, George C. Scott, which I used to think was really funny and over the top, now I'm thinking, no, that's no, what that's those real. guys are. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Merkin Muffley uh, is like an ineffectual <laughs> jackass. Like, no, that's... And I'm watching it, and I'm just finding it so upsetting and so sad, and I thought, shit, man, I, I can't make a comedy because hmm. I'm not laughing at all. This is really getting to me. Um, screenwriting methodology... Uh, I have a ritual, actually, uh, which I've stuck to. Uh, but I have, I'm more or less a Nazi about how story is structured and how to tell a story in a movie. And I, I, I feel, if I may say this, it's a bit of a lost art form. Because uh, I, wa I watch a, a movie every night. I have a wonderful screening environment and all that. And I try to go out to the movies on the weekends. But uh, usually, though, to not new movies. So mm -hmm. I'm probably guilty of killing off the medium, just like anybody. But uh, what can I see, though? Oh. What's for me? You, for you. <laughs> for me. You could see Roma. You could yeah. see Support the Girls. You could okay, see Beale Street that. Guitar. There's, there's all uh, kinds I, of that hasn't there. come out yet. Okay. What's that? Shoplifting. 
Shop 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 Shopless Corriata. Corriata. playing here, which yeah, is great. Okay. Yeah, okay. I've, I've seen most of the ones you just you mentioned. You can see burning. You could say this. Yeah, but okay. Widows. Okay. All right. No, I, Other recommendations. I, my, yeah, no, but my point, yes. <laughs> yes. But first of all, <laughs> yes, I can and I do. Okay, good. But uh, that's not most of the year. They come out at the, the fall, yeah. right? Uh, if, if it's June, I'm sorry. I'm right. fucked. <laughs> True. You know what's so, good for that is film festivals. Yeah. They are. That's part of <laughs> yes. the reason why occasionally I do yes. this sort of thing. All right, good. So, uh, um, all right, we should get another oh, couple of questions I in. I was about to tell my screen oh. right there. But oh, no, yeah, but sorry, quickly, sorry. What I know very quickly okay. what I do is I write uh, every idea I have on an index card. And I make it more detailed and more detailed and more detailed, more of my thoughts. Then I write a treatment. And I write the treatment again. And I write the treatment again. I make it as detailed as possible. And then I write the outline. And if the outline is 50 or 60 pages, then I'm ready to write the script. And when that happens, the script comes in about four or five weeks. It happens very quickly. But to make that outline very detailed is very important. Now, by the way, one more thing, and I'll be very quick about this, with screenwriting. Uh, if you want to see what the best outline, most thought through thing ever is, Francis Coppola published his Godfather outline, and you can buy it, and every screenwriter should look at that, because that guy put in the work, and you can see it in the movie. It's incredible, this document. And then he wrote the script, and guess what? Movie's not bad. <laughs> you gotta put in the work. And it's like, you know, my doctor was like poking around my pancreas, and he's like, or my liver, or whatever, and he's like, you know, I just made a movie on my iPhone. It's like, <laughs> no, you gotta be like Francis Coppola, who like spent like eight months writing this outline. It's like 80,000 pay, you know what I mean? I, I yeah. think that's the, that, that is truly the death yeah. of the medium. You know, yeah. we talked about this last night that the Beatles played together every night in Hamburg, Germany for two years, eight hours a day, six days a week. Now, they all became drug addicts, unfortunately, as a consequence, but they, <laughs> they went to Hamburg, and they weren't probably very good, and they left Hamburg, and they were the goddamn Beatles. You need to put in the time, and there's no evading it from a screenwriting perspective. Got to put in the time. Thank you. All right. I want to go up to the back here. I know you've got the microphone, so yes, please ask your question. Next question to this person, the, their hand up in the very back. And we're going to have to leave it there, OK? So we get the microphone up there as well. So go ahead, please. You can go ahead. Yeah. Oh, um, thanks so much for being here. Oh, I here. thought the back. I don't know. I'm looking down here. I'm going back. Uh, right here. Right here. Gotcha. I know. Yeah. I know. I see him now. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I totally agree with the aspect of having cinema in schools, because just finding the movies that change your world is the most, I don't know, for me as a creator as well, is so important. And you came into my your work came into my life at the same time I found uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, Alexander uh, Jodorowsky, and I really find this powerful, thought-provoking work. And in reading the uh, interview where you talked about the nature of losing the narrative and losing the story structure, um, I was wondering how do you begin deciding on a picture? And I know um, Sidney Lumet talked in his book, there's always a purpose of why I choose to enter a project. What is it about the work that you've done? How do you decipher, I'm going to decide to do this, and I'm going to devote the next portion of my life to this? OK, can you hold that thought, please? Um, we'll just go to the last question up here in the back. You've got the mic already? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Um, so watching your movies, I see a lot of... Um, where, where is this? Uh, um, right in the standing oh, gotcha. in the back right yeah. there. Hello, sorry. In the corner. Um, watching your movies, like. I get this... I get a lot of archetypal religious um, connotations that are kind of diffused through the story. Um, you know... Uh, uh, what's that? Um, sorry. Um, Lost City of Z, it's almost like a Percivilian search for the Holy Gra Grail. Um, uh, we Own the Night, kind of the Cain and Abel story. Yeah. Uh, even at Astra, it could be Journey to the Underworld to Save Your Father, mm -hmm. or on top of that, Sins of the Father and its implications on the child. Um, I wanted to know, was this a conscious decision that these archetypal religious connotations come out of your storytelling? Um, if yes, I'd like to know what that, what that says about you. Um. <laughs> Listen, buddy. Yeah. It was the best question I ever got in my life, and you just blew it. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's okay. I'm That's kidding. fine. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, and if not, if, if it is subconscious, what do you think that says about storytelling in general and the archetypes 
okay. that are infused within the structure right. of narrative. Thank you. So religious archetypes in your films, and how do you decide which project to make and which what are you going to commit to? Um, I'm going to answer the first question first because sure. I don't know what the hell my answer is to the second All question. Right. <laughs> so um, how do I choose? I, I have no idea is the answer because what happens usually is, if, and, and maybe this is a problem, maybe this is, maybe this is a problem actually, what comes to me usually is a mood that uh, I, I start feeling. It's a very weird thing, like I start feeling a mood that I want to communicate in a movie. I remember with Two Lovers, for example, it was like this guy at the beach who was... Uh, you know, who was heartbroken. I remember that was the first thing that came to me. I wanted to do something like that and uh, maybe an updating of The Underground Man that Dostoevsky uh, wrote about in several of his novellas. But, uh, and then this, that was a mood that I felt. And for the latest thing, I felt like, you know, floating in space. What does that mean? I saw this footage of Ed White, who was uh, later actually killed, but was the first American to go on a spacewalk and the first person really because the Russian who did it did it for like two seconds. He was the first one to do an elab uh, a lengthy spacewalk, and he felt a weird space euphoria, but you see the footage, and it's horrifying, and, and he was apparently going through euphoria, but it's also horrifying. I thought, well, that's interesting, and then I mm -hmm. decided maybe to explore that, that avenue a little bit. Um, but maybe I can connect it to your question. Um, my taste is for uh, archetypes because, uh, you know, there is a kind of uh, egotistical and pompous approach I take, which is a little bit humiliating to admit now. Uh, but we're here, I'll be honest, so why not, right? You want to hear the honesty. Uh, you want the thing to last. Y you want people to be able to see it 50 years or 100 years from now and for it to make some sense. You want to be able to contribute to the medium, not in a way that just allows you to buy a big house in Beverly Hills or something, really great cars, you know, just fucking make a sequel to a remake or whatever, <laughs> which, you, which I could do. And I would be much richer than I am now. I would also make something that probably, probably, people wouldn't be caring about. And maybe this comes from ego. But it's not only ego, because uh, some of it is that, you know, one of the lessons you learn in life, I think, is that this idea of being famous is a nonsense. You know, I was talking to uh, my friend's son. He's 19 years old, and he's extremely well-educated, and he goes to an elite university in the United States. Extremely well-educated. And I remember when J. Edgar came out, I said, do you know who Her uh, J. Edgar Hoover is? He said, yeah, he, he was the president before Roosevelt. Oh, and you're like, no, Herbert. that's Herbert. <laughs> and my point isn't that he's not smart. The kid is brilliant. My point is that you realize, oh, wait, Herbert Hoover and J. Edgar Hoover are now kind of ancient history. Now, Her Her uh, J. Edgar Hoover was forced out in uh, 1973. I was alive. This kid was born in, you know, 2000 or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I can't blame him for it. And you realize that anyone who's seeking fame it's kind of a fool because there's really like Shakespeare and Homer and maybe two other people or whatever in Western civilization that you know of. So the only thing you've got left, if that's the case, that should drive you if you're an artist, if I may call myself that, is you try to contribute as best you can to this thing that we call progress, kind of to, to push things forward a little bit. And if nobody knows who you are, that's going to be the case. But that's okay. One person walking through a museum who sees a painting that nobody ever heard of that moves them greatly, and you know, Picasso sees a piece of African art and he makes uh, that sculpture with the, you know, the, the bicycle seat. And all. You know, in other words, it's not about the individual anymore. It's about what can you do to contribute to the, to the culture. And so uh, for me, if I look at the past as prologue, it's archetypes that really last. Uh, for Western civilization, of course, for the world it's very different, but for Western civilization, the Greeks kind of figured it out, didn't they? I mean, if you, uh, Oedipus Rex is still the most relevant, I mean, like, it's, it's so important to who we are. Uh, Shakespeare, we, it doesn't really veer far from Shakespeare, you know, that 
the, the beauties of Shakespeare are still understood, even though the language is beautiful but difficult for us. So when you pursue uh, cr the creation of a work, you're really doing it not for money or for fame or even for yourself. You're doing it, as my very good sculptor friend says, he says you do it for time. It's what you're trying to do to give back. Now, if you become successful and rich and you can get a nice table at a restaurant, that's an excellent byproduct. But that's not why you, you got to do it. That's not why you should be driven to do it. And so that is connected to the creation. What matters over time? What matters over time to me is my relationship with my father, my relationship with my mother, my brother, my relationship with my wife, my children, how I see them grow up, what kind of world we live in, what's wrong with the world. I think pointing out what's wrong with the world is very important for artists. That's what should motivate much of what we do. If we point out what's right with the world, who cares? All you have is hope. The whole world blows up. You're the last person surviving. You hope there's one other person. You hope there's a can of tuna fish. You can eat it. <laughs> we always have hope. You don't need hope. You need someone or some people, really, because that's what cinema is, from people. It's a collaborative medium. To point out what's wrong. And to me, that's beautiful. To me, that's the reason that we pursue this dream. So it's connected, your question. And there is a religiosity to it, I guess. And it's, by the way, it's the first time I've ever been asked that question. And yet it is clearly true that there's religion all over. The immigrant is unbelievably religious. And I, I, in a way, it's, 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 it for, forms her whole code, right? She, she, doesn't, she cannot violate that code, she, that, that deal she makes with God. Or when she does, it destroys her inside. I just feel like it's part of the collective myth that allows us to survive in this world. Now, we know post-1968, we know all that myth-making is bullshit. We know it's all a fantasy, but we need it. We still need it, even though we know it's bullshit. So it's best to kind of acknowledge that fantasy. You know, I have very unlimited tastes. You know, I've said, you know, we need narrative and we need that fantasy, but my taste with narrative is quite wide. You know, I'll accept things that feel not narratively based as long as I can trace a thread, a through line of thought. But ultimately, we come back to these myths. I hate to sound Campbellian because he has his limitations, I think, in some ways. But he really was onto something. And I think this is what makes our pursuit beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. James Gray, I've got to leave it there. James Gray, thank you so much. Thank you.